I'm Dr. Don Brown, CEO of Lifeomic. When I was in medical school, I thought of life as a minefield that you had to run across. It seemed like there were all these rare but totally disconnected diseases that we'd learn about, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, osteoporosis, and atherosclerosis, and so on. As a young medical student, it seemed to me that if we could just avoid stepping on one of these landmines, we'd be okay as we went through life. And I don't think I was alone. Most physicians still view these as largely independent disorders. However, a different view has begun to emerge over the course of the last decade or so. It's interesting to plot the prevalence of these diseases in different age groups. What you find is that the prevalence of all these diseases increases rapidly as people get into their mid-40s and beyond. It turns out that age itself is the main risk factor for these diseases. Increasingly, it's looking like the same mechanisms lie at the root of all of them. Things like DNA damage, aggregation of misfolded proteins, damage to mitochondria, and so on. So, what had seemed like separate diseases really aren't so independent after all. Rather than running across a minefield, as we age, we're moving over a set of interconnected tunnels that are hollowing out the ground beneath our feet. Exactly where the ground gives way makes it look like one disease or another, but it's all pretty much the same under the covers. Although this is a complex field with much yet to be discovered, one aspect of this aging process has become clear, that of senescent cells. As you know, our bodies are comprised of various organs and tissues that all arose from a single fertilized egg cell. This cell divided into two, and those into four, and that process continued to make the trillions of cells that now comprise you. As we age, however, more and more of those cells start to lose the ability to divide. You see, our cells have built-in quality control systems that can shut down the cell division machinery if they detect a problem, like unrepaired DNA damage. To oversimplify a bit, imagine that there are two quality inspectors in the cells, one named P21 and the other named P16. P21 is fairly relaxed and gives the cell some time to try to fix the problem. Once the problem is fixed, P21 stamps the paperwork and lets the cell go on dividing. P16, however, is a hard ass. When it finds a problem, it revokes the cell's license to divide forever. Now the poor cell just sits there. It's still alive, still metabolically active, and oddly enough still capable of growing, but it can no longer divide. These senescent cells are often compared to cars in which the driver has both the brake and the accelerator pressed at the same time. A car like that goes nowhere, but it makes a terrible racket and spews out nasty fumes. Well, senescent cells are very similar. They're still taking in glucose and other sources of energy. They're still producing proteins and patching their membranes. It's kind of sad in a way because these cells are preparing for a day that will never come, division day. Because they're continuing to build stuff, they eventually have to get rid of it by secreting into the local environment. And the secretions are generally inflammatory and harmful to nearby cells. This phenomenon has been given the fancy name senescence-associated secretory phenotype, or SASP. A particular irony is the fact that senescence probably arose as a way to prevent cancer because keeping damaged cells from dividing does exactly that. However, the inflammatory secretions emitted by senescent cells actually increase the tendency of neighboring cells to become cancerous. Over time, senescent cells accumulate in every tissue throughout the body. They cause skin to become saggy and wrinkled and have similar adverse effects in the liver, heart, brain, and every other organ. The secretory pollution from senescent cells leads to an overall increase in inflammation with age that has been called inflammaging, 
and is now recognized as an important contributor to everything from Alzheimer's to osteoporosis. So, what does all this have to do with intermittent fasting, you might ask? Going back to our car analogy, one of the main forces applying the accelerator is insulin, or more precisely, a protein sensor inside the cell called mTOR that's activated by insulin. We'll talk more about mTOR in another video because it's that important. But for now, just know that mTOR sits inside the cell, monitoring the amount of energy available for growth and division. If it hears insulin knocking at the cell's door, it knows there's plenty of carbohydrate. It also has sensors for amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. So when we're in a fed state with lots of carbohydrate, protein, and fat floating in our bloodstream, mTOR is pressing hard on the accelerator, telling the cell to crank out all the stuff it needs in order to divide. But as I've described, in senescent cells, P16 has permanently welded the brake to the floor, so the cell is unable to divide. Are you starting to get a feel for how we might solve this problem? That's right, fasting. You see, starving ourselves long enough to let the liver's glycogen battery run out eventually starts to diminish the GO signals coming in to mTOR. As the glucose levels start to drop, so does insulin. And less insulin knocking on the cell's door dials back the activity of mTOR. So does the drop in amino acids that comes with starvation. And as the cell's overall energy levels begin to drop, a low fuel alert in the form of a protein called AMPK goes off. And AMPK is an inhibitor of mTOR. The net effect of starving ourselves for a few hours is like backing off the accelerator in our car analogy. The inflammatory emissions start to drop and the cell has a chance to breathe and recycle components. In an earlier video, we talked about how cells switch to using fatty acids and ketones after 12 or so hours of fasting. It turns out that senescent cells are less able to make this switch, so prolonged fasting can actually cause them to die. This is a good thing because they are quickly replaced with younger, healthier cells that don't spew out the same inflammatory pollution. Fasting is also beneficial to non-senescent cells because it causes them to recycle old components to a degree that helps them from themselves becoming senescent. So let's recap what we've learned in this video. First, over time we accumulate senescent cells that are still alive and growing but can no longer divide. These senescent cells are more than just useless. They create an inflammatory environment that increases the chance that neighboring cells become senescent or even worse, cancerous. This cellular senescence occurs throughout the body and is associated with a wide range of different diseases that increase with age. If you look deep inside the cell, you see two main actors in this drama, mTOR pressing the gas pedal and P16 pressing the brake. Intermittent fasting forces mTOR to ease off on the gas pedal, even in normal cells, giving them time to relax, recycle, and repair. In senescent cells, the lack of gas can even cause the cell to die, allowing it to be replaced by new healthy cells. This whole picture helps explain why calorie restriction is associated with drastically lower rates of cardiovascular, neurodegenerative, and other diseases. But we don't have to live with permanent caloric restriction. Intermittent fasting will give us the same benefits while allowing us to eat, drink, and enjoy our lives between fasting periods. I don't know about you, but I think that's great.